everyone, so here's chapter 22, the house with no flags. And so a monthly tax of two gold ducats was imposed on every household in Cornucopia to protect the country from the Ichabog. Tax collectors soon became a common sight on the streets of Cornucopia. They had large, staring, white eyes like lamps painted on the back of their black uniforms. These were supposed to remind everyone of what the tax was for. But people whispered in the taverns that they were Lord Spittleworth's eyes watching to make sure everybody paid up. Once they'd collected enough gold, Spittleworth decided to raise a statue in memory of one of the Ichabog's victims to remind people what a savage beast it was. At first, Spittleworth planned the statue of Major Beamish, but his spies in the taverns of Shoeville reported that it was Private Buttons' story that, really, that had really captured the public imagination. Brave young Buttons who'd volunteered to gallop off in the night, into the night with the news of the Major's death, only to end up in the Ichabog's jaws himself, was generally felt to be a tragic noble figure deserving of a handsome statue. Maybe Jabemish, on the other hand, seemed merely to have died by accident, blundering unwisely across the foggy marsh in the dark. In fact, the drinkers of Shoeville felt quite resentful towards Beamish, as a man who forced Nobby Buttons to risk his life. Happy to bow to the public mood, Spittleworth had a statue of Nobby Buttons made and placed in the centre middle of the largest public square in Shoeville. Seated on a magnificent charger with his bronze cloak flying out behind him and a look of determination on his boyish face, Buttons was forever frozen in the act of galloping to bring the city, galloping back to the city within the city. It became fashionable to lay flowers around the statue's base every Sunday. One rather plain young woman who'd laid flower, who laid flowers every day of the week claimed she'd been Nobby Buttons' girlfriend. Well, that can't be true, can it? Because Nobby Buttons wasn't real. Spittleworth also decided to spend some gold on a scheme to keep the king diverted because Fred was still too scared to go hunting in case the Ichabog had sneaked Sire somehow and pounced on him in the front in the forest. Bored of entertaining Fred, Spittleworth and Flapoon had come up with a plan. We need a portrait of you fighting the Ichabog, Sire. The no nation demands it. Does it really? said the king, fiddling with his buttons, which were, which that day were made of emeralds. Fred remembered the ambition he'd he'd formed the morning he'd first tried on battle dress of being painted killing the Ichabog. He liked this idea of Spittleworths very much. So he spent the next two weeks choosing and being fitted for a new uniform because the old one was much stained by the marsh and having a replacement jewelled sword made. Then Spittleworth hired the best portrait painter in Cornucopia, Malik Motley, and Fred began posing for weeks on end for a portrait large enough to cover an entire wall of the throne room. Behind Motley sat 50 lesser artists, all copying his work, so as to have smaller versions of the painting ready to deliver to every city, town and village in Cornucopia. While he was being painted, the king amused, amused Motley and the other artists by telling the story of his famous fight with the monster, and the more he told the story, the more he found himself convinced of its truth. All of this kept Fred happily occupied, leaving Spittleworth and Flapoon free to run the country and to divide up the trunks of gold left over each month. Oh which was sent in the dead of night to the two lords' estates in the country. But what might you ask of the 11 other advisers who'd worked under Herringbone? Didn't they think it odd that the chief advisor had resigned in the middle of the night and never been seen again? Didn't they ask questions when they woke up to find Spittleworth in Herringbone's place? And most importantly of all, did they believe in the Ichabog? Well, those are exa all excellent questions and I'll answer them now. They certainly muttered amongst among themselves that Spittleworth shouldn't have been allowed to take over without a proper vote. One or two of them even considered complaining to the king. However, they decided not to act for the simple reason that they were scared. You see, royal pro proclamations had now gone up in every town and village square in Cornucopia, all, Cornucopia, all written by Spittleworth and signed by the king. It was treason to question the king's decisions, treason to suggest that the Ichabog might not be real, treason to question the need for the Ichabog tax and treason not to pay your two ducats a month. There was also a reward of ten ducats if you reported someone for saying the Ichabog wasn't real. The advisers were frightened of being accused of treason. They didn't want to be locked up in a dungeon. It was really much very, It really was much more pleasant to keep living in the lovely mansions which came with the job of advisor, and to continue wearing their special advisor robes, which meant they were allowed to go straight to the head of the queue in pastry shops.
So they approved all the expenses of the Ichabog Defence Brigade, who wore green uniforms, which Spittleworth said hid them better in the marshweed. The brigade soon became a common sight, parading through the streets of all Cornucopia's major cities. Some might wonder why the brigade was riding through the streets waving at people, instead of remaining up in the north where the monster was supposed to be. But they kept their thoughts to themselves. Meanwhile, most of their fellow citizens competed with each other to demonstrate their passionate belief in the Ichabog. They propped up cheap copies of the painting of King Fred fighting the Ichabog in their windows and hung wooden signs on their doors, which bore messages like proud to be paying the Ichabog tax and down with the Ichabog, up with the king. Some parents even taught their children to bow and curtsy to the tax collectors. The Beamish house was decorated in so many anti-Ichabog ban banners that it was hard to see what the cottage beneath looked like. Bert had returned to school at last, but to Daisy's disappointment, he spent all his breaks with Roderick Roach talking about the time when they would both join the Ichabog Defence Brigade and kill the monster. She'd never felt lonelier and wondered whether Bert missed her at all. Daisy's own house was the only one in the city within the city that was entirely free of flags signs, and signs welcoming the Ichabog tax. Her father also kept Daisy inside whenever the Ichabog Defence Brigade rode past, rather than urging her to run out into the garden and cheer like the neighbour's children. Lord Spittleworth noticed the absence of flags and signs on the tiny cottage beside the graveyard and filled, filed that knowledge away in the back of his cunning head where he kept information that one may one day, that might one day prove useful. Chapter 23, The Trial. I'm sure you haven't forgotten those three brave soldiers locked up in the dungeons who'd refused to believe in either the Ichabog or, Ichabog or Nobby Buttons. Well, Spittleworth hadn't forgotten them either. He'd been trying to think of ways to get rid of them without being blamed for it, ever since the night he'd imprisoned them. His latest idea was to feed them poison in their soup and pretend they died of natural causes. He was still trying to decide on the best poison to use when some of the soldiers' relatives turned up at the palace gates, demanding to speak to the king. Even worse, Lady Islander was with them, and Spittleworth had the sneaking suspicion that she'd arranged the whole thing. Instead of taking them to the king, Spittleworth and the group showed them had the group shown into his splendid new chief advisor's office where he invited them politely to sit down. We want to know when our boys are going to stand trial, said Private Odgen's brother, who was a pig farmer from just outside Baronstone. You've had them locked up for months now, said the mother of Private Wagstaff, who was a barmaid in Jer a Jeroboam Tabern. And we'd all like to know what they're charged with, said Lazy Islander. They're charged with treason, said Spittlewoff. Spittleworth wafting his ha scented handkerchief under his nose with his eyes for on the pig farmer. The man was perfectly clean, but Spittleworth made meant to make him feel small, and I'm just sorry to see he succeeded. Treason, repeated Mrs Wagstaff in astonishment. Why, you won't find any more loyal subjects of the king anywhere in the land than those three. Spittleworth's crafty eyes moved between the worried relatives, who so clearly loved their brothers and sons very deeply, and Lady Islander, whose face was so anxious and a brilliant idea flashed into his brain like a bolt of lightning he didn't know why he hadn't thought of it before he didn't need to poison the soldiers at all what he needed to do was ruin their reputations your men will be put on trial tomorrow he said getting to his feet the trial will take place in the largest square in shoeville because i want as many possible people as possible to hear what they have to say good day to you ladies and gentlemen and with a smirk and a bow spittleworth left the astonished relatives and proceeded down into the dungeon dungeons the three soldiers were a lot thinner than the last time he'd seen them, and they hadn't been able to shave or keep very clean. They had they made a miserable pictures picture. Good morning, gentlemen, said Spittleworth briskly while the drunken wall warder snoozed in a corner. Good news, you're to stand trial tomorrow. And what exactly are we charged with? asked Captain Goodfellow suspiciously. We've been through this already, good fellow said Spittleworth, you saw the monster on the marsh and ran away instead of staying to protect your king. You then claim the monster isn't real to cover up your own cowardice. That's treason. It's a filthy lie, said Goodfellow in a low voice. Do what you like to me, Spittleworth, but I'll tell the truth. The other two soldiers, Odgen and Wagstaff, nodded their agreement with the captain. You might not care what I do to you, said Spittleworth, smiling. But what about your families? It would be awful, wouldn't it, Wagstaff, if that barmaid mother of yours slipped on her way down into the cellar and cracked open her skull? Or Ogden, if your pig farming brother accidentally stabbed himself with his own scythe and got eaten by his own pigs? 
or whispered to Bitterworth, moving closer to the bars and staring into Goodfellow's eyes, if Lady Islander were to have a riding accident and break her slender neck. You see, Spitalworth believed that Lady Islander was Captain Goodfellow's lover. It would never occur to him that a woman might try and protect a man to whom she'd never even spoken. Captain Goodfellow wondered why on earth Lord Spitalworth was threatening him with the death of Lady Islander. True, he thought her the loveliest woman in the kingdom, but he'd always kept that to himself, because cheesemakers' sons didn't marry ladies of court. What has Lady Islander got to do with me? he asked. Don't pretend, good fellow, snapped the chief adviser. I've seen her blushes when your name is mentioned. Do you think me a fool? She's been doing all that she can to protect you, and I must admit it's down to her that you're still alive. However, if it is the Lady Islander who'll pay the price if you tell the truth, any truth but mine, tomorrow morning. She saved your life, good fellow. Will you sacrifice hers? Good fellow was speechless with shock. The idea that Lady Islander was in love with him was so marvellous that it almost eclipsed Spittleworth's threats. Then the captain realised that in order to save Aslander's life, he would have to publicly confess to treason the next day, which would surely kill her love for him stone dead. From the way the colour drained out of the three men's faces, Spittleworth could see that his threats had done the trick. Take courage, gentlemen, he said. I'm sure no awful accidents will happen to your loved ones as long as you tell the truth tomorrow. So notices were pinned all over the capital announcing the trial and the following day an enormous crowd packed itself into the largest square in Shoeville. Each of the three brave soldiers took it in turns to stand on a wooden platform while their friends and families watched and one by one they confessed that they'd met the Ichabog on the marsh and had run away like cowards instead of defending the king. The crowds booed the soldiers so loudly that it was hard to hear the judge, Lord Spittleworth, was saying. However, all the time Spittleworth was reading out the, the sentence, the imprisonment, life imprisonment in the dungeons, Captain Goodfellow stared directly into the eyes of Lady Islander, who sat watching in, high in the stands with the other ladies of court. Sometimes two people can tell each other with more than a look, than others could tell each other with a lifetime of words. I will not tell you everything that Lady Islander and Captain Goodfellow said with their eyes, but she knew now that the captain returned her feelings, and he learnt, even though he was going to prison for the rest of his life, that Lady Islander knew that he was innocent. The three prisoners were led from the platform in chains, while the crowd threw cabbages at them, and then dispersed, chatting loudly. Many of them felt Lord Spittleworth should have put the traitors to death, and Spittleworth chuckled to himself as he returned to the palace, for it was always best, if possible, to seem a reasonable man. Mr Dovetail had watched the trial from the back of the crowd. He hadn't booed the soldiers, nor had he brought Daisy with him, but had left her carving in his workshop. As Mr Dovetail walked home, lost in thought, he saw Wagstaff's weeping mother being followed along the street by a gang of youths who were booing and throwing vegetables at her. You follow this woman any further and you'll have me to deal with, Mr Dovetail shouted at the gang, who, seeing the size of the cow up and her, slunk away. Oh no, I was... Hopefully, it's all going to work itself out because at the moment it looks like Cornucopia's not doing particularly well under the rule of Lord Spittleworth. Anyway, have a go at the Purple Mash activity and next week we'll see what happens next.